The unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect truth is seldom met with, even in a hundred thousand myriad kalpas. Now we can see and hear it, we can remember and accept it. I vow to make the Buddha's truth one with myself. Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Thank you all very much for being here today. It's, it's really lovely to have you. So I was asked to talk today about despair. So the, the title of the talk is A Few Antidotes for Despair. So, you know, I think of myself as a person who came, you know, kicking and screaming to the practice and to Buddhism. Um, some of you may know that um, I was raised in a Buddhist family and, you know, we, it, was a, it was just normal for us to recite the mealtime verses. Um, you know, I'd go to the temple regularly as a child and there were monks around. Um, but it took me many years to see for myself um, that Buddhism actually offered an answer to the despair I, I was experiencing. You know, something that's, that goes far beyond any type of self-medication or distraction I could conjure up. And beyond the usual panaceas offered, you know, in a weekend mindfulness class or on TikTok or whatever it is. Um, so today I'd like to talk about despair, how we can train with it, um, and how we can find the light of the Buddha for ourselves, no matter how dark the situation we find ourselves in. So despair is defined as the feeling that there is no hope and that you can do nothing to improve a difficult or worrying situation. I think something that many of us, or probably all of us, are familiar with, at least in some way. The Latin word for despair, desperare, <laughs> I looked it up, can be broken down into the prefix of the de, de meaning without, and sperare means to hope. So with despair, there can be this sense, you know, at least in what I have experienced, uh, you know, this is my life and I can't see you know, a way out of this. There can be, of course, a sense of hopelessness. And for me, um, inertia that seems to have no beginning and no end in sight. And as much as this can seem you know, like, quote unquote, the truth to us, when we're in total despair, um, this isn't what the Buddha taught, because the Buddha taught that there is a cessation of suffering. One of the fundamental teachings across all Buddhist traditions is the teaching on the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha taught that suffering exists, the cause of suffering is clinging, that there is a cessation of suffering, and that we can find this cessation by following the Noble Eightfold Path. In the first Noble Truth, the Buddha taught that suffering, or dukkha, exists. Dukkha means something like stress, unsatisfactoriness or suffering. So the Buddha says, or said, birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Association with the unbeloved is dukkha. Separation from the loved is dukkha. Not getting what is wanted is dukkha. In the second noble truth, the Buddha tells us that the cause of suffering is clinging. So when we don't know about the Buddhist teachings on the Four Noble Truths, it's normal we pursue the things in life that society tells us are important. We look for fulfillment and purpose and happiness in our relationships, in our job, in our appearance, in our material possessions, in everything, except our true refuge. And of course, we can find fulfillment and purpose in many aspects of life. But when we lose these things in life that, you know, that we so treasure due to impermanence or these things, you know, uh, 
just change? How do we make sense of this in our life and our world? You know, what do we do? So in the third and fourth noble truths, the Buddha tells us that there is a cessation of suffering and that we can know this for ourselves, you know, by, by practicing the noble eightfold path. And I think it's important to say here that the, the noble truth on the cessation of suffering is something that goes, it goes way beyond the cure-alls of society that promise us a happy life. You know, the self-help books, the <clears throat> mindfulness classes, and the weekend seminars. So back to the Noble Eightfold Path. Just as it suggests, the Noble Eightfold Path involves eight practices or steps that lead us to this place of true peace of heart, something that we can all know for ourselves. I'm not gonna go into detail on this. Um, I know many of you are already familiar with it. So the Noble Eightfold Path is comprised of right view, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, and the development of wisdom. And of course, I know most of us are already familiar with the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. But how can we put these teachings into practice, you know, especially when we find ourselves in a place where we feel like we can you know, neither move forwards nor backwards nor to the side? Luckily for me, I didn't have to, you know, spend weeks researching this talk, you know, scouring the sutras, um, looking for inspiration, um, because I would say this topic is very near and dear to my heart, something I've been training with most of my life. I would say that for as long as I can remember, you know, I was an extremely unhappy person. My mother tells me that I cried a lot as a baby. And, you know, I seem to not really have slowed down until I would say probably a couple of years ago. And, you know, everything in my life, you know, looking back as a child and as a young adult, um, it was, they were all, it was all an area from which I sought to escape. You know, everything was a source of pain. Home life, school life, uh, work life, all of those things. As a child, I can actually even remember, you know, having an asthma attack, and this happened several times. And deliberately, you know, I didn't take my rescue inhaler as a child. You know, I, I hoped that I would, I would die. I didn't want to, to keep living. And, you know, I might have been 12, 13 years old. And thankfully, that didn't work out for me, so. The other way that I expressed anger, or my despair and unhappiness as a child was through anger and, and rage. I didn't know how to express myself, to express the hopelessness and, you know, anger that was going on inside, so. Um, my uh, MO was I would scream, I'd stomp my feet as loud as I could, I'd slam doors, I'd hit my siblings, I'm sorry to say, um, you know, and so on. My other coping mechanism um, was any form of escape or distraction that could take me away, you know, even temporarily. So, of course, this for me in, in included uh, watching TV for hours on end, you know, I would barely move from my spot. Then there was cooking, you know, long before I was chief cook here. Even as a child, I'd spend hours baking and cooking and looking at cookbooks. At one point, I, I had the largest collection of cookbooks of anyone I knew. I had to give them all away when I became a monk. Um, then there was books in general. As a teenager, you know, I could spend up to eight hours a day um, just lying on my bed reading novels. And, you know, looking back, actually, these novels were a lifeline, uh, something, you know, that got me through the day and kept me alive. So I'm grateful for that. And, uh, you know, as I got older, the list of escapes, you know, expanded to include, ex you know, excessive drinking when I was out with my friends. That's just what you did. So knowing what I know now about Buddhism, 
I, of course, I never would have told my younger self that my suffering was caused by clinging because that wouldn't have been helpful, you know, and I wouldn't have known at the time how to put the teaching into practice. Because we have to come to the practice when we're ready, and that takes as long as it takes. So back to the kicking and screaming part of how I came to Buddhism. So I never intended to take the precepts and to become a Buddhist, or for that matter, to move to the monastery at the age of 29, you know, but here, you know, but here we are. <laughs> There was an important turning point for me in this story, and something that turned me a complete 180 um, on, you know, from the path I was on. I tell this story a lot, so forgive me if you've heard it 10 times, but I think it's, it could be helpful. When I was 24, I was traveling in Europe with a friend, and uh, we, actually it was my best friend at the time, and Pretty much from the time we landed, things were going disastrously. Um, you know, we, we were just fighting all the time, and neither of us knew how to work things out, you know, in, in, a, in a better way than that. And I remember at one point, I was sitting in a hotel room by myself. She was gone, and I was crying, crying, crying. I couldn't stop crying. And you know, just kind of this, this sense of being in, in a complete pit of despair and, and knowing I couldn't go on on the trip if things were going to be like this. I couldn't. There's just no way. It was just too difficult. And, and you know, as I was sitting there on, on the bed, um, there arose, you know, this very strong sense that there had to be more to life than just the suffering I was experiencing. It was, it was very clear to me. I know I can be a bit of a slow learner, and as I said before, you know, it takes as long as it takes. Um, for me, it took a big dose of suffering, the seed of Buddhism planted years earlier, and you know, a mountain of despair at the right moment, you know, without any shoulder to cry on. So it took that for me to see what I actually needed to do with my life. So I came back to Canada, I asked to take the precepts, and from that moment on, um, you know, I knew that no matter what was happening around me, no matter how poorly I was treated by others, or screamed at, um, you know, I, I knew I couldn't change their behavior, but I could do something about myself. And this was key. I could work on not creating more suffering for myself and for others by doing my best to keep to the precepts, you know, I could choose to be angry and take it out on others, especially those I cared about. I could slide into, dis into despair, <clears throat> you know, like a comfortable chair that I knew well, or I could work on myself one tiny step at a time. One of our monks often says that our practice is simple, but it's not easy. The past 20 years or so, you know, since I've taken the precepts, have shown me the truth of this. Taking the precepts was a turning point in my life, but I also, you know, I had to put the Buddhist teachings into practice. Things didn't magically get better for me overnight. Um, it was more of a subtle shift over time, you know, from, I would say, complete and total despair to very despairing to intermediate despair and so on. <laughs> What did shift for me right away, you know, was the sense of purpose, actually. Um, it was like a beacon, uh, knowing there was a greater refuge, and that was what was important to me, knowing that there was something greater. Becoming a Buddhist, taking the precepts and the three refuges, you know, means that we begin to take refuge in that which is greater than ourselves, the unborn, Buddha nature, you know, whatever you want to call it. Because there is this call of the heart um, that happens for all beings, you know, to know that which is greater, to know that unshakable peace of heart. Um, and we can know this for ourselves through and through. But we have to be willing to put in the work. One of the most helpful teachings that I received when I was a novice, and I think about it, you know, quite often, 
is the teaching that no effort is wasted. And with some time, you know, I can look back and, and see the importance of this teaching in my life. Um, you know, if we find ourselves in a place of despair or any other difficult mind state, I can certainly tell you from my own experience that even the microscopic steps, um, they add up over time. And just remembering as a lay person, I didn't always have time to meditate in the morning. Um, I always seemed to be, you know, just running from one thing to another. So I just started to, to meditate on sitting on the edge of my bed. Sometimes it was one minute, two minutes, three minutes. Uh, sometimes that was the best I could do. Then in the car on the way to work, I would listen to morning service, and you know I would I would uh, sing along with the scriptures. So, and you know what I really found after a period of time was that these two small things uh, they set the tone for the day, um, in, in a remarkable way. It wasn't that my day would go just perfectly, um, but it it was a reminder um, that there was something much greater for which we train. And I really credit you know that small effort, you know, amongst many other things, during a very difficult time in my life to help me keep going. Um, and it was, in fact, an important um, effort to counteract the despair. On days here when, when you know, I've been too unwell to do much of anything, um, the truth of the teaching of no effort is wasted, you know, it's, it's proved true to me just in something simple like setting my shoes straight or speaking kindly to another, you know, if that's all I've been able to do. When I can do these small things, you know, with that um, part of meditation there, um, something in the heart responds with a quiet joy. In the Shishogi, great Master Dogen says, I love this line, should you live for a hundred years just wasting your time, every day and month will be filled with sorrow. Should you drift as the slave of your senses for a hundred years and yet live truly for only so much as a single day, you will in that one day not only live a hundred years of life, but also save a hundred years of your future life. The calling of the heart to practice is, is the call to know that which is greater. And we can do this in, in countless small ways every day. In our meditation, even if it's just two minutes, our keeping of the precepts as best we can, setting our shoes straight, you know, a kind word to another, you know, just whatever we can muster. And I know this can be a, a bit of a bitter pill to swallow, but the thing about despair and anger and any other difficult mind state, you know, in essence, is that in essence, um, it's all about us. And it can shrink our world down, you know, to just us and what we're experiencing. You know, we become the center of our universe of suffering and it can be difficult for anyone, you know, to breach, to breach that, to breach our bubble. And when we're in the midst of despair, um, we can't necessarily see it, um, but this is a type of clinging, um, seeing and believing our despair as the truth. And in a way, you know, it can become a refuge for us. I know from my experience, um, I can say that sometimes the devil we know is better than the devil we don't. And, you know, being in a constant state of despair wasn't fun for me. You know, at the time, it was better than having to face what I needed to face. Um, because in truth, that was almost the scariest part of it. So what can we actually do about despair? First thing I would say is to remind yourself that this mind state is not the truth. You know, this too is, an, is impermanent. This isn't our true nature. 
Because when we're in the midst of despair, there never seems to be a way out, you know, by its very definition. What I know now, you know, from experience is that seeing the despair as it's arising, just recognizing it is a huge piece of converting it. And it seems so simple, but it's like if I can just watch my mind and see, oh, this is despair. This is some great advice that I received from a wise monk, and I know it to be true now. Because when we learn how to meditate, you know, we begin to hone the skills we need to watch what the mind is doing. And when we learn how to watch what the mind is doing, we have a hope of seeing what's going on. You know, ah, here, here comes despair, or here comes anger, or jealousy, or whatever. Because this is just the arising of despair, or whatever else. This isn't who we truly are. This isn't the truth. You know, in this feeling, or emotion, or state, um, it will eventually pass. You know, if we don't hold on to it, and identify it with it and make it a refuge. So we can watch our minds as best we can. The next thing I would suggest is finding skillful ways of helping ourselves. For me, with despair, um, I find that there's an accompanying inertia that goes with it. So, you know, in the past, in particular, if I found I was going through a really hard patch, I'd make myself go for a walk. And while I was walking, you know, I would use my mala and recite the three homages. And what I really found was this was, you know, a skillful way um, to literally help myself move through the despair. So another way, um, I'm now also the owner of a soft, fuzzy, stuffed cat who's named Fergus. And, uh, I spell it F-U-R-G-U-S, so you, you know, get it, Fergus. Um, and this was also a gift from a wise monk. I can't really have a, a cat in my room because of allergies, but this gives me something um, to hug when the going gets tough. Um, and there are so many ways that we can help ourselves. Knowing what can help and putting it into action can be a significant step in moving through despair. Maybe it's just something like putting on clean clothes or taking a shower. Um, and if we find ourselves with a stuffed cat or armadillo at the age of you know, 40 or 60 or whatever, um, and judgment arises from yourself or others, you know, just do the best that you can to let go of that judgment. You know, it might be strange to others, but really doesn't matter. Because this is a, this is a way to help ourselves and it and it, I think it actually shows a great deal of compassion. So the Buddha taught that all beings suffer just as we suffer. And when we find ourselves in despair or any other difficult mind state, you know, here we are in the center of our own world of suffering, we can use our knowledge of the Buddha's teaching on suffering to help others. If we're all wrapped up in what's going on in our own lives, you know, I know it can be hard to recognize maybe our coworker is having a really hard time, or you know, we don't see the, the frazzled clerk at the bank who could actually really use some kindness. So I think making a deliberate practice of helping others or making offerings you know, when we're in a difficult mind state, can be so helpful. So again, I'm speaking from experience. It doesn't have to cost anything to help others. Um, just thinking about it, it could be something as simple as, you know, truly listening to someone instead of just like waiting so you can get your two cents in, you know, just like really listening to somebody. That's an offering in and of itself. You know, it could be sweeping the cloister here at the monastery, it could be shoveling snow at, at home or your neighbor's sidewalk, you know, any of these little things. You know, I think these moments present themselves to us all the time and really it's just, it's up to us to recognize them and, you know, to notice and to make the offering. And really, um, there is no offering that's too small. The, la <clears throat> Excuse me. 
The last suggestion I have for counteracting despair, or really any other difficult mind state, um, is the practice of gratitude. So this could look like you know, making a habit of thanking others, you know, even when we don't feel like it. Um, or at the end of the day, maybe just finding three things you can be grateful for that day. Maybe it means writing it down, you know, like in your, in your planner or on your, on your phone or whatever it is, or just sitting quietly with it, reflecting upon it. I think you know, doing this every day can actually have a profound impact on our outlook in life, um, really if we can allow gratitude to find a toehold in our lives. So. As a child, I, I watched um, the Anne of Green Gables miniseries more times than I care to mention. Uh, in one scene, and the protagonist tells Marilla, her adopted mother, you know, she says something like she's full of despair and asks Marilla if she ever, if she ever despairs. And Marilla is quite the stern kind of character and she replies, no, to despair is to turn your back on God. So I always remember that. And I think I'm remembering that, that correctly. I think, you know, to despair is to believe that there's nothing that can be done in the situation we find ourselves in. But the truth is, you know, we always have a choice. We always have a choice to believe in and take refuge in the despair or to turn towards that which is greater than ourselves. I think for some people, you know, big acts of faith might be helpful, um, but for many of us, um, it's the small acts of day-to-day -day life um, that work upon us, that help us to convert that despair and to take refuge in that which is true. So meditation, even if it's just on the edge of our bed, making the commitment to do something about ourselves, you know, by practicing the precepts as best we can. We don't have to have taken them formally to do that. Finding skillful ways of helping ourselves and practicing gratitude, making offerings no matter how small, and seeing the despair for what it really is. It's a mirage, a passing state, and keeping on going no matter what. So these are just a few of the things that have helped me, and I hope that they can be helpful for you too. Thank you very much.